All right, everyone, it's time to talk about poles and polling aggregates again, because some people don't seem to be able to wrap their heads around this, and it becomes frustrating, because, like, poll analysis is sort of, like, why I'm known in the first place. I mean, I've branched out at this point, and, and you know, I'm known for botanical content to some degree, but a lot of it's political analysis. Um, an attempt to limit my own personal bias, because, of course, I have classically liberal-slash-libertarian views, this definitely plays a role in who I hope will win in political races. But it's like, uh, I, I would support the LP if it would just, you know, go back to a sane platform, but that doesn't make them necessarily viable in an election. I may want Trump to win, and I'll vote for him, but I can't allow that bias to, to color my analysis of polling. Everybody loves outlier polls. Trump loves them, Biden loves them, Democrats and Republicans, People on the right, people on the left, men and women, gay and straight, everyone loves outliers. Everyone loves polls that comport to what they want reality to be. And this is the biggest problem within political analysis. This is why Karl Rove broke down in 2012. This is why Nate Silver in 2016 looked like he was covered in, in pounds of bacon grease. This is why these people fail. Because they conflate what they want to happen with what is actually going to happen. So, like, when Nate Silver looks at, at polls and you know, completely ignores actual analytics in 2016 and therefore gets it wrong, or in 2018 when he vastly overpredicts the odds of a blue wave, which didn't happen, um, which is why Zhang had a breakdown on live TV and that was really funny, why Karl Rove assumed Romney would win in 2012, which reasonable people knew wasn't going to happen, their personal bias is seeping in. So if you start artificially limiting data to see the world through rose-colored glasses or through blue lenses, if you're a Democrat, I suppose, now it becomes a problem. When I look, therefore, at polling right now, here's one fact. Donald Trump is considerably behind Joe Biden in all the competitive states. At the same time, fact number two, statistically speaking, and according to several very reliable statistical models, that's not necessarily a bad thing that he's behind at this particular point, especially with the trajectory of the way things are going. Point number three, Hillary Clinton at virtually all times was ahead of Donald Trump in 2016, but by a considerable margin at times. Point number four, though, Biden has extended that lead and, and has maintained that for some time. We can look at the enthusiasm gap. We can look at polls and stuff, but if you, if you take a list of 10, 20 polling points, and you say, well, did you hear the new Rasmussen poll? Trump is ahead of Biden again. I, I, I'll sit there and chuckle. Or when CNN releases a poll showing Trump's approval cratering to 30% or something. These are outliers. You should completely ignore them. Here's how, by the way, one thing we do have to get clear is that there is massive media bias against Donald Trump at this point. Uh, it's not an illusion. It, it's not a conspiracy or anything like that. It's simple truth. Even analysis by legacy media firms of legacy media coverage. I think, that, didn't The Atlantic run a story a couple of years ago about, about the coverage of Trump and comparing it to uh, mainline coverage of Obama and Bush and, and showing the differential, and it was like a massive tilt towards negative coverage? And at the time, of course, there was no reason to have negative coverage. The economy was chugging, chugging along, no wars or anything like that. Other than orange man bad, there was no reason to speculate Trump was an abysmal failure. Even now, with the problems that are going on, the lopsidedness of coverage plays a role. So when you see polls reported on, you should always check against the aggregate because you'll find that nine times out of ten, the poll that is, is an outlier statistically that deviates well beyond the aggregate and shows Trump cratering. Likewise, if you see Trump posting about a poll on Twitter, you can be sure that it's an aggregate, usually Rasmussen, although occasionally not, and it shows him with, with a much rosier picture than the aggregate shows. The aggregate will show him five or six points behind, but Rasmussen will release one that says he's a point ahead, his approval's 51, uh, glory be. It's an outlier. It's not actually statistical reality. Now, if you only have a few data points, as unfortunately we have in certain competitive states, uh, in certain, certain metrics politically at all times, Unfortunately, you can't necessarily tell what the outlier is. Then you have to do guesswork. This is what sunk my prediction in Wisconsin both times in 2016. One of only two states, by the way, that I ended up getting wrong as far as who I believed would win it. And it was close, of course. In the primaries, I expected Trump to win against Ted Cruz. 
there was no statistical reason not to believe that. The, the three numbers that I had showed Trump ahead in two of them, and then in one almost a dead tie with Tr Cruz, I think, eking out a two-point lead or something. I looked at that and said, well, the, the largest sample is associated with, what was it, uh, Gravitas, I believe. Um, that shows Trump ahead. You've got these other two polls. They, they comport loosely to that reality. I think the outlier is Gravitas, but I think that Trump is ahead. I expected him to win. Cruz ended up winning by double digits. But that's because the aggregate, the, the guesswork that I did trying to guess which poll was the outlier, of course, I was wrong. And, and there was a, a, at best a 50-50 shot of making that call. And I pointed out before that happened that I didn't, I didn't find it easy to make the call number one and it could just as easily be wrong. And of course I was. Uh, in Colorado, which was close, of course, I had guessed uh, Trump narrowly picking that up, if I remember correctly. I think I got that wrong in the general. Wisconsin, I got wrong in both the general and the primaries. It was the only state like that. Wisconsin was all sorts of screwy. Apparently, Cruz capitalized upon a hidden vote related to uh, sort of like the AM radio circuit that's big in Wisconsin and gobbled up a bunch of votes that way, like in the 11th hour. <laughs> it wasn't reflected polling. It's really funny. Uh, but again, if I had looked at outlier polls, I could have seen a scenario where Trump, you know, ends up winning a state like California. At the same time, I could guess that Texas would have gone blue. People that made those kind of predictions were invariably wrong because they didn't use aggregated models. This is why when people say, well, Sticks, you should know better than to pay attention to polls. I don't pay attention to polls. I pay attention to polls of polls. The only number that matters in, in the end is the final real total. But you can guess what the real total will be if you look at an aggregate, if the aggregate has enough data points. And so this is just a little bit of a statistical rant for people. I know that I've, sp I've spoken about this before, but it does, it gets under my skin. When people are trying to second guess my analysis, despite the repeated accuracy of the analysis, and they persist in, in telling me about how great Rasmussen is or something. Karl Rove literally made that mistake with Rasmussen as the main poll he waited for, by the way, back in 2012. That's not that long ago. The paradigm has shifted, but it's not done shifting, and we're still stuck enough in that paradigm that that same sort of thing can have it can be in play. This is why when H. A. Goodman predicted the Republicans managing to gain power in the House based on poll weighting, I said he was wrong, and of course I was correct about that. And Hillary never did get into the race, now did she? Of course, it's still time. Biden is a sick old man, so you never know what they're going to do before the convention there. Maybe he'll be right. It'd be funny, Clinton out of nowhere, third time's a charm, with running mate Jeb Bush. That's about all. Peace out.